Right, now it's your turn now. You can be as abusive as you like. You can throw things at me. You can agree with me. You can ask questions. You can do as you wish. So let's open it up. The floor is yours. Yeah, I heard you talking about um, that we should focus on a global economy instead of just a European economy. But uh, things as they're being now, like uh, China's coming up, India's coming up, and they work for 50 cents an hour. We have social standards, laws for environment, so on, so on. Uh, isn't it more agreeable to form a European trade bloc as to uh, oppose these new coming economies that work for nothing? It's interesting that you ask that because most people think that the European Union is a free trade area. That's what most people think. And indeed, my parents, when the Brits had a referendum on this back in 1975, my parents both voted yes because they were told they were voting for a free trade area. They never were. The European Union is a customs union, not a free trade area. Now this, this is a point that the general public don't get. Interestingly, it's a point that many businesses are already just beginning to hoist on board. But the difference, of course, is fundamental, isn't it? That you, know, you and I can form between us a free trade area. And we can agree to operate with each other on a certain set of rules. And that's fine, because we both freely enter into that. No problem. And I can take you tomorrow. I've had enough of this. You know, I don't want it. Let's end it. Let's call the whole thing off. Fine. Easy, straightforward, simple. And across the world, there are lots of little free trade agreements and quite a lot of big, free, you know, NAFTA, for example, quite big free trade agreements. The difficulty with this as a customs union is that you and I, sir, are not just bound by what we do with a customs union, we are also bound outside of that. Now, I appreciate different countries have different sizes and may have different interests, but look at it from my point of view. You know, I come from the UK. I come from the most globalised country in the European time zone. That because of language, because of our financial markets, and because of our incredible relationship through the Commonwealth with lots of other parts of the world. You know, we've got Australia, Canada, New Zealand, India begging us, begging us through the Commonwealth to enhance trade relationships between us. And we have to say, no, sorry, we can't do that. We're forbidden from doing it by our membership of the European Union. So you're right, we face big global challenges, big competitive global challenges. And you know, I made the point in my talk that if we go on protecting ourselves with layer after layer after layer of legislation, we actually make ourselves less competitive and we hand business over to other countries. But I do think that, that if we look at the way global trade is configured, we look at the way it's argued for through the World Trade Organization, the European Union is the only customs union of any size in the world. It is completely and hopelessly outdated by at least 50 years. It is not the future. It is not the way forward. I want a Europe where we're free, as I say, to agree things between each other, but we're also free if we choose to negotiate our own trade deals across the world. The future in this 21st century globalised economy, the future will be best for those who are flexible and adaptable and can move with the times. Does that answer your question? Well, sort of. It uh, says uh, your point of view, uh, for sure. So. Oh, it's my point of view, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. Okay, there was another one somewhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, I agree that, of course, the European Commission, the fact that it's not a, a democratically elected, it's, it's, it's true, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, I also trust the European Parliament that can uh, approve this new European Commission uh, each five years and has to check on the European Commission as the European Parliament is democratically elected. So we, uh, it's also a re representation of the view of the population. Plus, of course, the uh, European Commission can uh, do a proposal we cannot make a law, we can do a proposal. And it's the European Parliament that is elected, that has to approve it. Plus, together with the ministers, which we also elected, they together have to approve and get a, a decree signed. So, uh, if you don't agree what uh, happens in the European Union, the decision that has been made, maybe you just don't uh, 
find enough support, but then again, that's also the consequence of the movement. Well, I mean, let's just, let's just remind ourselves of one thing. That, and, I, and I'm going to repeat this, because it's true. Uh, I think it, it, it has a bearing on your comments. Let's just remember that the European Commission, the bureaucracy, has the sole right of initiative. Only they can propose legislation. Only they have the ability and the power to propose the amendment of legislation, and then yes, you're right, it does come through the European Parliament, but the European Parliament itself does not have that power and does not have that ability. Now, your other argument that, um, that somehow these commissioners have democratic legitimacy because the European Parliament has voted for them, sorry, I don't really agree with that. And we've had a long-running exchange, my friend Mr. Barroso and I, um, who I do like in a way, because he's got a good sense of humour. He needs it while I'm around. And, 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 you know, and I keep saying, but Mr. Barroso, you have no democratic legitimacy. And he keeps saying, but of course I do. I was voted for by this parliament. Yes, he was, but we were only given the choice of one candidate. I don't call that democracy. I call that the political class rubber stamping its own. So I don't buy the argument. I don't buy the argument. Look, look. The challenge to democratising the EU came up ten years ago, when the great Giscard d'Estaing was setting up the European Constitution. Had the people who were behind this project been Democrats, that was the opportunity. They could have democratised the European Union, they could have made the government of Europe come from the Parliament itself, they could have made that democratically accountable once every five years at European elections, they could have transferred the role of the Commission into being the civil service that actually carried it out. They could have turned it into a proper democratic form of government. And I challenged them again and again and again on this. And I said, if you do that, and if you put it to referendums of the peoples of Europe, you may well win. You may well inspire people into thinking that something of value here is being created. I said, I won't want it myself because I believe in something called the national interest. I won't want it myself, because I, I don't want a European flag. I don't want a European anthem. I want my own. Thank you very much indeed. But had they done that, they may well have won. They didn't do it. Because right from day one, this project was set up by a man called John Money. These people are not, I repeat, undemocratic. They are anti-democratic. They hate democracy. They see it as being inconvenient, because once every four or five years, a government that's taking this course is replaced by a government that takes that course. They didn't do it, they will never do it, and that is why we have to bring this whole thing down. It is damn dangerous, it is now turning into something that is subjugating the peoples of Europe to a new system of government, which increasingly resembles the one that mercifully fell to pieces in the Soviet Union 20 years ago. Come back. I find the idea of a European Commission that is uh, made from the people that are elected in the Parliament very interesting. But then my question would be, um, who would you choose or how would you decide it? Because of course you cannot say there's a majority or a minority in the European Parliament uh, because we all have different political groups and backgrounds in different countries, bigger countries, smaller countries, so you can't, you can't even base it on the, on the votes or, or the number of votes. Or, so how would you organize this? Uh, how would you choose them from the parliament that is elected? Well, that's not for me to do, is it? Uh, yeah, I, I am not going to be constructing the European state. Um, I, don't think, I don't think there is any democratic will for, for a European state. The point I'm making to you is that those that run this, if they were Democrats to their fingertips, would have thought all of this through and found a system. And I'll and I tell you why democracy works. You know, I, I remember very well in the 1970s when Britain was such a state-controlled country and you know, income tax rates for top earners of 83%, um, all of our bright and best young people leaving Britain, emigrating all over the world. You know, my own father, who was appalled by all of this, but, you know, he didn't join an underground resistance movement. He just, he, he just determined that he would back the Conservative Party to win the election of 1979 and to overturn things. And that's the great thing about democracy. Even if you're unhappy with the majority government of the day, you vow 
that in future you will get rid of it and change it. You know, I'm reminded of my friend Herman here, uh, whose antecedents fought, fought for 500 years against the British with guns and bullets and bombs to break away from the United Kingdom to set up their own independent Irish free state and now they see themselves, now they see themselves as no more than a province of this set of European institutions. I put it to you that we will see Irish nationalism and violence again because their identity and their democracy has been taken from them and that's just how serious I think this whole thing is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask one question. Your analyze is, uh, is very correct, it's even worse. But what I ask to you and all the nationalist, nationalist persons who are in that parliament, what the fuck are you doing there? Well, that's a very interesting comment. Um, actually, history is full of this. History is full of this. Um, am I a nationalist? Not sure. I'm a nationalist. I believe in nations. So what you're doing in the Soviet Union? That's the Soviet Union we're speaking of. The well, European Union is the Soviet Union and the well, big chief is Germany, well, a look, central committee. Before I went to the European Parliament, which is way back in 1999, goodness me, I'm a veteran now, before I went to the European Parliament, we had been sending people by direct election from Britain for 20 years. For 20 years, we'd sent MEPs to the European Parliament. Uh, all of them had about the same profile in Britain as Herman Van Rompuy has got across Europe. No one knew what their names were. No one knew what the European Parliament did. No one knew what the European Parliament cost. And I went in there in 1999 with a very simple agenda. That was to discover the truth about what was going on in the European Parliament and the European institutions and to report that back to the British people as accurately and as fairly as I could. And do you know something? <clears throat> Since 1999, the percentage of Britons that now want us to have a political divorce from this union and its replacement with a proper you know, trade agreement and friendship agreement with our European neighbours has soared. I think that the UKIP policy of taking those seats and reporting back has helped British public opinion enormously. And I'm also, you know, I'm also proud to say but I have been able to link arms with people fighting in the referendums in Ireland and France and elsewhere. So I think it's been a constructive and, and a correct thing to do, uh, but don't worry, you know, I'm not going to go native, um, I'm not going to get bought by the system, and given the opportunity, I promise you, sir, that I would be the only Turkey that would vote for Christmas. All right? <laughs> Absolutely promise you that. Uh, it's funny because I often get that question in, in, in the UK media. They say, well, how can you go to a parliament that you don't think we should be a part of? And I point out that Alex Salmond, the leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party, has, had, was a member of the Westminster Parliament for over 20 years. Alex Salmond quite happily went to Westminster as someone that didn't want to be there. There are, there are in fact, through history, quite a lot of precedents for it. Yes, but throughout through history, our persons in Ireland, they didn't go to the parliament in Westminster. Well, Sinn Féin, you're right, Sinn Féin did adopt the not-take-the-seats policy. However, before that, there was a man in the 19th century called Charles Parnell, who did go to the Westminster Parliament, and he decided to use the rules of procedure in the Parliament in such a way to try and make Gladstone's life completely miserable and totally hell. And in fact, poor old Gladstone, I mean, he tore what was left of his hair out. And in fact, they nearly got the Irish Home Rule Bill as early as 1885. Parnell's tactics very nearly worked. Um, you know, what in the end got Ireland its independence? Yes, it was partly the big Sinn Féin vote of 1918, but actually it was the after effects of a massive world war. So attending parliaments and causing trouble can do a lot of good. And when, uh, when they changed the rules, and when they changed the constitution of the Lisbon Treaty, I got a meeting together of like-minded MEPs, and I said, look, as far as I'm concerned, it's no more Mr. Nice Guy. You know, we have played for the rules in all the years that I've been here. They've now broken the rules. We're now going to give them hell. And that was when we started with, you know, we, we had our big demonstrations and our referendum posters, and they started fining us all and the usual sort of thing. 
unlike the Westminster Parliament, when we really frustrated their procedures and put in speaking requests to keep the Parliament open all night, all they did, of course, was just change the rules. Because there are no rules in this European construct. This is, you know, what we're up against here. We are not the nationalists. Those of us that want our nation states are not the nationalists. What we are up against is a new phenomenon. It is called Euro-nationalism.